Frodo was left to himself for a while, for Sam had fallen asleep. He was alone and felt rather forlorn, although all about him the folk of Rivendell were gathered. But those near him were silent, intent upon the music of the voices and the instruments, and they gave no heed to anything else. Frodo began to listen. At first the beauty of the melodies and of the interwoven words in elven tongues, even though he understood them little, held him in a spell as soon as he began to attend to them. Almost it seemed to him that the words took shape, and visions of far lands and bright things that he had never yet imagined opened out before him, and the firelit hall became like a golden mist above seas of foam that sighed upon the margins of the world. Then the enchantment became more and more dreamlike, until he felt that an endless river of swelling gold and silver was flowing over him, too multitudinous for its pattern to be comprehended. It became part of the throbbing air about him, and it drenched and drowned him. Swiftly he sank under its shining weight into a deep realm of sleep. There he wandered long in a dream of music that turned into running water, and then suddenly into a voice. It seemed to be the voice of Bilbo, chanting verses, faint at first, and then clearer ran the words. The chanting ceased. Frodo opened his eyes and saw that Bilbo was seated on his stool in a circle of listeners who were smiling and applauding. Now we had better have it again, said an elf. Bilbo got up, got up and bowed. I am flattered, Lindir, he said, but it would be too tiring to repeat it all. Not too tiring for you, the elves answered, laughing. You know you are never tired of reciting your own verses. But really, we cannot answer your question at one hearing. What? cried Bilbo. You can't tell which parts were mine and which were the Dunedins. It's not easy for us to tell the difference between two mortals, said the elf. Nonsense, Linder, snorted Bilbo. If you can't distinguish between a man and a hobbit, your judgment is poorer than I imagined. There is difference as peas and apples. Maybe to sheep. Other sheep, no doubt, appear different, laughed Lindir, or to shepherds. But mortals have not been our study. We have other business. I won't argue with you, said Bilbo. I am sleepy after so much music and singing. I'll leave it to you to guess, if you want to. Welcome. I'm Professor Rachel Fulton Brown, and this is The Forge of Tolkien. Why did Bilbo expect the elf Linder to be able to tell the difference between a man's voice and a hobbit's voice? There's, of course, a trick in that, and that most of it is all Bilbo anyway, and Aragorn has only added a bit about the green stone. But there's this, this, this interesting conversation that they have that Linder and the elf insisting he can't tell the difference between two mortal languages, and Bilbo saying, no, 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 they're as different as peas and apples. They, they should have a different flavor as it were. Backing up a little bit, why was Frodo, if the elf can't understand or can't tell the difference between the Hobbit composition and the Manish composition, why then was Frodo able to understand anything <laughs> when he fell into that dream of the elvish voices sort of just washing over him as if he was in a stream and that he could he the 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 language they're saying he he felt as if he'd fallen under a spell i've of course lost my place now sorry <laughs> um that he he felt he'd lo he'd fallen into a spell uh, the words took shape and visions of far lands and bright things that he had never yet imagined opened out before him, suggesting that even though he can't understand the language that he's hearing, he can understand the sense that it's conveying. He doesn't know what the words are, but he knows the sense, because otherwise why would he have the vision of those lands and bright things that he'd never seen before? And that this enchantment, you should by now be I hope attuned to the fact that when Tolkien starts talking about things like spells and enchantment, pay attention, um, that there is there is a, a very sort of powerful sense that he has of what what language can do, which is of course our theme for today, um, but that it's tied here yet again with falling into something like a dream state. Well that's 
two hints for you. One, we're talking about language to, in, in this episode, and two is a bit more on the Notion Club papers, our dreaming practice. But I'd, I'd like to start by thinking just a little bit about this this problem of wh why shouldn't why should Lindir care? You know, why should Bilbo care whether Lindir can tell the difference between a man and a hobbit's voice, and why should Frodo be able to understand a language, understand the sense of a language which he doesn't actually speak. Well, both of those things are b bound up in a, in a deeper question is where language comes from, right? It, it, that if, if mannish speech and hobbit speech should be sufficiently different, Bilbo has, Bilbo says that they're as different as peas and apples, right? So there's somehow some different kind of plant, some different kind of growth. That That's also a hint that we should always be paying attention to botanical imagery <laughs> that Tolkien uses. He loves trees, <laughs> if you think about that. And here we have Bilbo saying languages are like different, um, I mean, like a fruit and a vegetable, or but two different kinds of plants, right? So there's something organic about them that they, they can grow and, and flourish, and that you should be able to, get the food metaphor, you should be able to taste the difference. But then Frodo having this sense that he's able to understand a dream language suggests that well, are, is, are, the, are the languages coming from something in the soil, perhaps? <laughs> or are they coming from somewhere else, right? Is it, is it the imagination? Well, but it, Frodo's hearing words that are real words in, in the sense that other people are saying them. So he's not making up the dreams himself. He's not dreaming something that's just his own fantasy. It's, it's coming to him and he falls into a dreamlike state and, and understands what's in the dream even though he's not participating in the language. Those are two very important clues for us that, that Tolkien is doing something interesting with saying we can have access to an understanding of language even if we don't speak it. How? <laughs> and that we should pay attention to the origin of languages as it were in the soil or in growth or in, in something like that. Well, okay, let's back up just a little bit. Just last week, the University of Chicago, which is where I teach um, my undergraduate and graduate courses, put out a statement, actually very specifically the English department um, at the University of Chicago. Um, I, I would say they put out the statement, they'd, they'd actually put it out back in July, but nobody noticed until <laughs> last week. Um, it's about time for term to start, and so it makes sense that um, people are paying attention to these sorts of statements now on the faculty pages. And the English department had a paragraph in their statement of purpose for what they think of themselves, what they think of their mission as. It's like the English department, right? The, 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 the um, faculty that teach English language and literature at my university, and what they, they, they said they were going to do was um, the, the, this, uh, maybe I should back up a little bit and start with this, the, the opening of the statement. The English department at the University of Chicago believes that black lives matter, um, and they mark that phrasing with the capital letters, like BLM, right, and it's, and it's italicized and everything, so they're saying the institution, the, the organization of black lives matter, right? Um, and that the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and Rayshard Brooks matter, as do thousands of others named and unnamed who have been subject to police violence. As literary scholars, if they're making this statement, this would be the, 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 the sort of parent um, the department, faculty in, in England would mean the, the department, it's the same thing. We say faculty in the US and in, in, in the United States to mean the the teaching people, right, the professors, which in England would be a little different too because professor is a different rank, but anyway, faculty for us in the United States means the people um, who teach, right? In the UK, it means the department, what we would say is the department anyway. So the faculty statement is department statement. It's interesting that there's two words for that, right? Um, so th th Tolkien would have been a member of the English faculty at Oxford, right, and um, would be teaching the kinds of material that my colleagues at the University of Chicago are saying they're teaching, but as literary scholars they feel like they have a particular 
mission, right? As literary scholars, we attend to the histories, atmospheres, and scenes of anti-black racism and racial violence in the United States and across the world. We are committed to the struggle of black and indigenous people and all racialized and dispossessed people against inequality and brutality. Now, that they frame this in the context of um, believing in Black Lives Matter as a movement. They, they are making a political statement and now they're saying that as scholars, they have a certain degree of engagement with these issues in, in, in the world um, and are committed to this struggle, right? So, this last as of last week, they had made a policy decision on the part of their own admissions um, only to accept certain graduate students. For the 2021 graduate cycle, admission cycle, the University of Chicago English Department is accepting only applicants interested in and working with black studies. We understand black studies to be a capacious intellectual project that spans a variety of methodological approaches, fields, geographical areas, languages, and time periods. Um, for more information on faculty and current graduate students in this area, please visit our black studies page. Well, that got um, a, a certain degree of attention in the, in the uh, online world and uh, some articles. I was asked to comment on one for um, the Federalist that one of our uh, history undergraduates wrote saying, what exactly are we doing <laughs> as an institution, as a faculty, concerning ourselves with the, the politics in this way? And pr particularly, why should the English department be making these sorts of decisions about its subject of study, saying only people, only students, graduate students, who are interested in the studies, the studies field. They don't say anything about the language that they're going to be working in, just black studies. Um, but that we understand black studies to be a capacious intellectual project that spans a variety of methodological approaches, fields, geographical areas, languages, and time periods. They are supposed to be the English department, and they are supposed to be um, teaching English <laughs> language and literature, but black studies for them is more important than the fact that they're an English department. Well, Ayam Hirsi Ali tweeted a response to this saying, I just tweeted an article about the University of Chicago English department. This is all too idiotic. Most of us don't know whether to laugh or cry. By the logic of their creed, wouldn't English be the oppressor's language? She carries on in uh, uh, a number of subtweets, right? Shouldn't they be fighting to replace that department with any of the following? One, the Chicago Fulani department. Two, the Chicago Ashanti and Hausa department, in which case they would know what the scarf Speaker Pelosi wore on her knees symbolized. Three, the Chicago Swahili department. Four, the Chicago Somali and Am Amharic department. Aren't all of these venerable languages worthy studying as much as, if not more than, that racist, colonial, and deplorable language, English. Now, there's a lot of <laughs> very interesting layers there, but for our purposes of studying Tolkien and thinking about what Tol what would Tolkien say, what would Tolkien think about this, notice the kinds, there's the, the, the kinds of political claims that my colleagues in English are making, saying we as a faculty recognize these um, concerns with history, atmosphere, and scenes of anti-black racism and racial violence, and in order to counter that violence, they're going to study, they're going to concentrate on, on black studies. What Ayan Hirsi Ali is, of course, pointing to is they're not actually studying languages that you might think were, quote, black languages, and, and she, you know, the ones she lists are um, African, right? Fulani, Ashanti, and Hausa, Swahili, Somali, Amharic, um, that, you know, it's, it seems hypocritical on the part of the English faculty to say we are going to concentrate on this capacious intellectual question without, in fact, changing the language that we focus in. And, and as far as Ali is concerned, it, it's, it's rather ironic that they're doing it in English because wouldn't their very statement preclude the study of the language that they are instituted to teach? Well, what would Tolkien say to something like that? Would he, you know, acknowledge that English is a racist, colonial, deplorable language? Would he acknowledge that it's a concern if you have um, 
issues of, of racism in your culture, in your world, that you should do it through language study? Would he, you know, think it was, I said he was a professor of, you know, Anglo-Saxon literatures in the English faculty. Um, would he think it would be a bad thing that you were studying Swahili or Hausa or Fulani? Well, one, Tolkien was born in South Africa, and so one of the languages that he heard growing up was Afrikaans. Um, and therefore, if you want, you know, sort of his birth language, the, the language that he would have heard as, as, as uh, in his earliest years, maybe he would have included that one as well. But this, this kind of battling over which language we should be studying and which one we think is more valuable for our intellectual growth, for our philosophical work, for our um, civilizational work, he would agree that it's important but he certainly wouldn't cast it in the terms that either, interestingly, the English department or Ayan Hirsi Ali have said in that they're, they're both, they're all operating, well, he, would he or wouldn't, they're all operating on the idea that if you want to have certain thoughts, you need to be working in particular languages. And in that sense, I think Ali is actually right. It, it, it might colleagues in the English department followed their own logic, they wouldn't be in English department anymore because there are good reasons to say, well, quite frankly, the reason that so many people in the world speak English now is the British Empire. And the more I've read in E. Michael Jones, particularly in his Baron Metal, the more I recognize that maybe the, English, <laughs> the British Empire had um, some issues. Well, maybe we'll, we'll talk about that, but the, the, the uh, particularly say in India in the 19th century, that the, the study of English literature as such, right, as a academic field has very deep roots in the colonial project because the people in India under the, the empire, particularly those who wanted to have jobs in the imperial government or, you know, have um, uh, commercial and, and political interactions with the British, were very interested in learning English and, you know, on the good side of the equation, by learning English, become a country, right? India doesn't exist as a, as a, as a single thing until post-British, right? After, after liberation in 1947, because before British, when, before the empire takes over the region, it's many, many different languages and many different um, political entities. And it's only because the British are there giving the creating this this imperial administration with english as the the necessary language that india becomes a nation at all and yet it, it doesn't exist as a nation in any of the terms that for example vox day has talked about in in his dark streams that you would have a people identified by uh, an india as a nation makes no sense because it's actually a, it's its own empire, right? It's this conglomerate. They they divided Pakistan out from the 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 um, Hindu population. So there's Muslims and Hindus, but the Hindu population is very diverse linguistically and and we would say racially. Um, well, it's complicated, <laughs> right? Backing up, back out just a little bit again. Well, what what would Tolkien say to the prospect of studying all the languages? Well, of course he would say, great, right? And that there is there there's sort of two levels of what I would like to talk about more substantively with you. One to say this this issue of who are we based on our languages is obviously very much alive, as witnessed by my my colleague's statement in the English department. Oh, by the way, I I checked this morning that paragraph about admitting only black student, study students is gone from the faculty, the pack, the department page. So I don't know what happened, <laughs> but no longer, that seems to be no longer the issue. Um, maybe they're going to back up and study English rather than studies, but we'll, we'll see. In any case, the, this is a live issue and it has been a live issue. It's been a live issue for much longer than just the last five years or the last decade. It's, it's, it was an issue in Tolkien's own lifetime and, and it was an issue in, as I suggested just now in, in alluding to the, the development of English literature as a subject in the colonial context, um, it, it's been an issue throughout modernity 
of defining peoples by way of their linguistic history. And Tolkien, as a philologist and as a professor of Anglo-Saxon, was very much caught up in that process. So, Tolkien's first answer would be we'd study all of them, but there'd be the second answer, which is a, a, a little bit confusing, that you would still take greater pleasure from some languages than others, and this is where things get a little bit tricky. I'm going to be talking um, about several interrelated concepts, and if you been watching and you know we're going to go to the Notion Club papers, you know things get really <laughs> kind of mystical when we when we go into the Notion Club papers, but the, the main the main ideas that I want to, to try to wrestle with in this question are one, this concept that Tolkien develops of what he calls native language, which should, you know, start off all sorts of, you know, alarm bells if you're with like, it's are we native because of our race? Are you know when Ayan Harsi Ali is making the argument that, well, if you're wanting to do black studies, maybe you should study the languages that you know mainly black people speak, not English, which was originally a language that lots of white people were speaking. Is it, it you know Tol Are we back there? Right? Is Tolkien going to take us there? Well, we'll find out. But one, there's this this idea that he has of native language. Um, two, and this this goes to the problem that Lindir and Bilbo were talking about, whether or not you can tell the difference between peas and apples, right? That there's a kind of flavor to languages. So your, your preference for language, and Tolkien does think that people have preferences for certain languages, but it's, it's you know, not necessarily because, you know, one, well, okay, <laughs> spoiler alert, it's not your skin color, but, <laughs> But it is a little more complicated than just saying it's it's because he does think it's something you're born with, curiously, complicatedly. So there's a native language and there's this flavor. But the thing is, you can be, well. And where does the flavor come from, and why do you like things more rather than other? Umbrella in this context is uh, a question of of how peoples are defined by their language. I've alluded to that in uh, I think episode two in our in this in this series. Um, and I hope I have time to talk about that a little bit more when we get through into the Notion Club papers, but this, this intertwining of native language, flavor, and what defines a people is our big problem for today. Well, we'll start back with what Tolkien said when he was asked about himself and um, what, you know, sort of where his stories came from, right? And we've looked at this, this um, letter before. This is letter 163 to W.H. Auden, um, written in June 1955, and, and I may actually have read some of this before, um, that Tolkien was, was talking about his own, his own study of language, right? And let's just review this. So he's, he's gone by way of allegory and the dream Right, we've been talking about the dream with the Notion Club papers, um, and he say, and then he starts talking about where he was born, and and that brings him to this question of which languages he likes best. Right, he says, "I'm a West Midlander by blood," by which he means his family. Right, and took to early West Midland Middle English as a known tongue as soon as I set eyes on it. Now, notice there's two different things there, but he's he's linked them, that he's a West Midlander by which means West Midlands of England, Mercia, the, the west part of the middle part of the island. Um, and his family comes from that region, but he didn't grow up speaking Middle English, right? He grew up speaking, well, he's going to say. Um, but as soon as he read Middle English, I set my eyes on it, right? So as soon as he reads it, he experiences it as something he's already knows. Right, so he's bound up, but but notice how regionally he's he's specifying. It's like I'm a West Midlander by blood, not English. He doesn't say English. I'm a West Midlander by blood, but perhaps a fact in my personal history may partly explain why the northwestern air appeals to me both as home and as something discovered. Right, so he feels that the language he's drawn to is something he's born into, but it's also something he found. 
I was actually born in Bloemfontein, South Africa. And so those deeply implanted impressions, underlying memories that are still pictorially available for inspection of first childhood are for me those of a hot, parched country. My first Christmas memory is of a blazing sun, drawn curtains, and a drooping eucalyptus. I just saw something about the early cover of The Hobbit saying that um, it was supposed to have a red sun on it and the printers didn't want to do th more than two colors, so it's blue and green. Um, but this, this th that vividness of the sun that Tolkien's saying he's remembering. So his earliest memories are not even of England. <laughs> They're of parched, a parched country and eucalyptus trees. Um, I'm afraid this is becoming a dreadful bore and going on too long, at any rate longer than this contemptible person before you merits. But it is difficult to stop once roused on such an absorbing topic to oneself as oneself. As for the conditioning, I am chiefly aware of the linguistic conditioning. I went to King Edward's school and spent most of my time learning Latin and Greek, but I also learned English. Not English literature, except Shakespeare, which I disliked cordially. The chief context with poetry were when one was made to try and translate it into Latin. So he's translating Shakespeare into Latin. Um, uh, he mainly was schooled in Latin and Greek and not English, which is, is actually important. And my colleagues in the English department are worrying about the sort of prestige of their, their discipline based on the current cl cultural climate. Um, English was not a particularly revere, uh, a prestigious discipline even in Tolkien's day. It was still considered like lesser classics, right? It's like if you if you were real, the smart people went into Latin and Greek and you know the, the rigorous training that you got in um, learning Latin and Greek was considered much more um, highbrow intellectually than English, right? Which was for women. <laughs> hmm. Maybe it hasn't changed, but that Tolkien said he you know he didn't even like studying Shakespeare, and his encounter with English literature was in this translation project. Not a bad mode of introduction, if a bit casual. I mean something of the English language and its history. I learned Anglo-Saxon at school, also Gothic, but that was an accident quite unconnected with the curriculum, though decisive. I discovered in it not only modern historical philology, which appealed to the historic and scientific side but for the first time the study of a language out of mere love now, this is important right he's like he, he's, he's learning anglo-saxon which is now by the by the time that he's in school um tied to the study of english language english literature right it's interesting because modern english literature departments don't typically spend quite as much time on the history of the language as they used to they they still tend to have Anglo-Saxonist and Middle English specialists in their field, but the the studies sort of focus that academia has fallen into tends to work against the proper historical study. I'm sure my colleagues in English will argue with me because I do we do have people at Chicago who work on the his, the history of, of the, his, the, the the literature from those historical periods. But as far as I'm aware, they're not doing it in the philological, philological way that Tolkien tended to, to enjoy. Uh, but he, he's saying, so he's studying Gothic and he discovers historic philology, which appeals to both historic and scientific, right? And I, I in thinking about what I would want to focus on today, I, I've, I've had to put to the side a little bit the philological, scientific, historic, put an asterisk on that. That's a hint. We'll be having a, a an episode on asterisk reality um, coming up, uh, but this the second is what I wanted to focus on. That he says he finding out he's studying a language out of mere love. I mean, for the acute aesthetic pleasure derived from a language for its own sake, not only free from being useful, but free even from being the vehicle of a literature. Now that's interesting. He's saying. He's studying Gothic, which we have very little literature on. Tolkien, Tolkien's poetry in Gothic is some of the only poems we have in Gothic. That he 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 enjoyed it simply aesthetically for its own sake, not even studying the literature. That it's free from being useful. You think about the way Frodo is hearing the Elvish, and it's dreamlike, and it's 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 this. Scent, the, the sense carried there, it's so purely aesthetic. He doesn't even, doesn't necessarily need to hear a story or anything. It's just there as this 
flavor, right? There are two strands, or three, a fascination that Welsh names had for me, even if only seen on coal trucks. From childhood is another, though people only gave me books that were incomprehensible to a child when I asked for information. I did not learn any Welsh till I was an undergraduate and found in it an abiding linguistic aesthetic satisfaction. So again, he's focusing on this, the, the, he, he, he saw the words on the train cars um, and then later studied the, the language properly, but what he is marking for Auden, who's a poet, um, is this, this aesthetic pleasure he takes from the particular languages. Spanish was another. My guardian was half Spanish. This is the priest who was his guardian after his mother died. And in my early teens, I used to pinch his books and try to learn it. The only romance language that gives me the particular pleasure of which I am speaking, it is not quite the same as in the mere perception of beauty. So now we, we know Tolkien already is saying he, he knows Latin and Greek. He learned Anglo-Saxon at school and also Gothic. He loves Welsh. He loves Spanish, which it is not often what you tend to associate Tolkien with. He's always the northern air and the northern climate, but he loved Spanish and, um, and found it very, very beautiful. I feel the beauty of, say, Italian, or for that matter, of modern English, um, which is very remote from my personal taste. It is more like the appetite for a needed food. Again, this, it, it's interesting, of course, language is something you do with your mouth. And so he's talking constantly about pleasure, and now we're going to get more and more into this, that the, the pleasure is like eating. Most importantly, perhaps after Gothic, was the discovery in Exeter College Library when I was supposed to be reading for honor mods of a Finnish grammar. It was like discovering a complete wine cellar filled with bottles of an amazing kind, amazing wine of a kind and flavor never tasted before. It quite intoxicated me and I gave up the attempt to invent an unrecorded Germanic language and my own language or series of invented languages became heavenly finicized in phonetic pattern and structure. Okay, now we've had, he's pointed to the fact that he's also inventing languages and that they have this flavor, this Finnish flavor. But pay attention to what he said about, you know, when he discovered this grammar, right? <laughs> it's not the literature. He just, he discovers the grammar and it, it the grammar itself is like finding a fine a wine cellar filled with these intoxicating flavors. That is, of course, long past now. Linguistic taste changes like everything else as time goes on or oscillates between poles. Latin and the British type of Celtic have it now, with the beautifully coordinated and patterned, if simply patterned, Anglo-Saxon near at hand, and further off, the Old Norse with the neighboring but alien Finnish, Roman British, might not one say, with a strong but more recent infusion from Scandinavian and the Baltic. Well, I dare say such linguistic tastes with due allowance for school overlay are as good or a better test, wait, of ancestry as blood groups. Now this is, this is where he gets sort of potentially complicated and dangerous and what is he talking about? How, what? That your affinity for your languages is a test of your genealogy? You remember he started there with, he, he's West Midlander um, and in, in that sense, um, you know, when he found Middle English and, and of that dialect in particular, he was, he was quite drawn to it. But, and then he's gone through all of these other languages. I liked Gothic, I liked Finnish, I like Spanish, I like Italian. Is he saying that he is, in fact, all of those bloods, right? His, his, his blood group, ancestry, blood group. Um, I've seen people, you know, playing with, you know, sending their, their blood off to 23 and me and trying to figure out what they are. It, it, you know, how, how seriously is he tying his pleasure in languages to this idea that, well, you, you like the language best that you're born to like? Well, he, he oscillated a lot between these kinds of claims um, in a number of different contexts. He was writing to Auden, in, this is in um, June 1955. In October 1955, he gave a lecture. It was, um, sorry, I always know that I should look at more details than I do. Um, he gave the O'Donnell Lecture at Oxford on 21st of October 1955, um, which was the day after the publication of The Return of the King. 
and this um, the lectures were established to treat of the British or Celtic element in the English language and the dialects of the English counties and the special terms and words used in agriculture or handicrafts and the British or Celtic element in the existing population of England and um, Tolkien's lecture was the opening lecture of a series given at Oxford and published in the Monsters and the Critics as English and Welsh. Um, if, if you're interested in the way in which Tolkien talks through his sort of sense of the meaning of language, it's it's a really critical essay, right? We're obviously only going to be able to, to sort of meditate on parts of it, but the, the there's a, a very interesting passage where he talks about this this intermingling of the concept that he has of native language, right, which I said we were, we were talking about, and the aesthetic pleasure you take from that language. And it's, it's curious because it's not really clear how deeply anchored he means either of these to be in, he says in ancestry, but it's a little ambiguous for him to say, well, if he likes all these languages, is it because he's he's got Spanish ancestry as well? He says, no, I have, you know, my, my guardian was Spanish speaking and I liked his books. But there is this, this, this tension that he's developing between a personal aesthetic and an inherited feel, right? He says, um, first, the, the basic pleasure Have I said enough to set that up? No, I, okay, so there's, there's a little bit more here. What, what, what is it that gives a language its character, right? Its sense and the, the specific thing that he's been talking about, well, um, is how, what Welsh is like and um, why it's a beautiful language to learn and in his letter to Auden he'd said that he'd, he'd seen the words on the coal cart on the coal trucks of the trains and was drawn to them simply as words so he's been talking now about um, the different uh, you know given giving some examples of different words in Welsh and pointing specifically to their phonetic um, character, right? That I like certain consonants, I like certain um, nouns, and that that, I, certain certain consonants, certain combinations of sounds. And it's this, that's that the pleasure that he's trying to get to. Now he's going to unpack that a little bit more. The basic pleasure in the phonetic elements of a language and in the style of their patterns, and then in a higher dimension, pleasure in the associations of these word forms with meanings is of fundamental importance. This pleasure is quite distinct from the practical knowledge of a language and not the same as an analytic understanding of its structure. It is simpler, deeper rooted, and yet more immediate than the enjoyment of literature. Remember how in the letter to Auden, he, he said that he, um, he first fell in love with Gothic at, at being free from being useful, being free from having, you know, sort of the need to, that that's made I get how Tolkien talks about these languages, but most of the language study I've done, that's not quite fair. This is not fair to myself, but a lot, most of the language study I've done is, 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 is utilitarian. I need to read the text in that language um, because I want to understand the ideas and they're only accessible, not in translation, but in the original, so I have to learn those languages. Tolkien is saying something completely different here. He's like, the pleasure that he has is not just, it's not from feeling clever. He's, he's clearly so linguistically gifted that it, that's just, you know, like worrying about whether or not you can play you can play the most simple scales in your Mozart, right? That it's the pleasure is not the the pleasure of feeling clever about learning n new grammars or new words. It's it's totally different from that, right? This intellectual pleasure that he has is not, or this pleasure that he has is not um, practical. He says it's simpler, deeper rooted, and yet more immediate than the enjoyment of literature. There's something, remember he didn't like Shakespeare for whatever reason, or he says he didn't, um, that he's trying to get at that sense that he has of, I just, I mean, basically saying I like the sound of it. <laughs> but 
for him that means so much more than just I like it's like music to him or this flavor though it may be allied to some of the elements in the appreciation of verse it does not need any poets other than the nameless artist who composed the language right it's like deeper than even the compositions it's just the words themselves it can be strongly felt in the simple contemplation of a vocabulary or even in a string of names right now one of the things that people who like Tolkien's invented languages, which we're hopefully going to have time to get to, um, or at least introduce as a, as a, as a top uh, part of this sense of taste, right, of languages. Um, they're very frustrated because Tolkien never wrote, wrote enough in them, right? He, if, you, if you know his, um, in, in the Lost World, the Lost World and other writings, we have the etymologies, um, which is the, the fullest thing that Christopher ever found of his father's making notes about his languages. And the etymologies are not even, it's not a dictionary, right? It's not an actual full vocabulary, it's roots, um, stems for saying things like kim, stick, cleave, adhere, kinya, himya, to stick to, cleave to, abide by, himba, adhering, sticking, um, noldor, him, steadfast, dividing, and as an adverb continually. It's, it's, it, I mean, I, I suppose suppose if you try to learn Klingon maybe it's a little different but learning to speak Elvish either Sindarin or, or Kenya it means having to work off of these roots that Tolkien discovered invented dreamed um, not translating the literature that he wrote I mean it's a, there's poetry in in the languages um, but he didn't he was mainly interested at this level of just flavor and names. String, it's not even the string of, I mean, a string of full words, right? It's strings of um, roots, stem roots. If I were to say language is related to our total psychophysical makeup, I might seem to announce a truism in a priggish modern jargon. I will at any rate say that language, and more so as an expression than as communication, is a natural product of our humanity. Okay, so that's uncontroversial, maybe. <laughs> that we speak, being human means speaking. And he's saying it's natural, it's a natural human capacity that we have to speak, but this, it's related to our total psychophysical makeup. He's grasping at something here saying, well, we've got this phonetic pleasure it's aesthetic, but it's not really in the literature, and it's down at the level of just names, and that's somehow a product of our humanity. But it is therefore also a product of our individuality. And this is where I get confused, right? Because he's, he's made this big push to say things about, you know, blood, you know, your ancestry being determined by, uh, you know, what languages you, sp it's not really what languages you speak, it's what languages you like, which is a little different because you could grow up well right we each have our own personal linguistic potential we each have a native language but that is not the language that we speak our cradle tongue the first learned okay now we're in like total like mystical land right because on the one hand he set us up I mean really the setup was great the my English department colleagues would be oh yeah Tolkien's gonna say that you know we're blood determined to, to be interested in particular languages and so I mean maybe I on here see how he is right that we should be speaking trying to speak the languages that we're born into because of our blood groups and then Tolkien goes no <laughs> not at all um, we each have our own personal linguistic potential, which is what he's tried to say with Auden, um, focusing on all you know his 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 uh, career through learning these variety of languages and which ones he liked and which ones he didn't like, and he didn't even really like English that much, which by certain counts should be what we'd say is his mother tongue because it's what his mother spoke, but that's for Tolkien not in fact his native language. Linguistically, it's very interesting. Linguistically, we all wear ready-made clothes and our native language comes seldom to expression. Now you realize that, in fact, what Tolkien's gonna say, well, our 
Kenya and Cinder in his native tongues, the ones that he you know that he actually expressed that the lang on the one hand he's saying language is a product of our humanity and there should be common because if you, if there are not two speakers of a language there's no language right That's, I don't know just a list of words although hmm he's making he's making this he did make his elvish vocabulary and that makes it all up and now maybe people speak it so are those real languages is a language real if only one person speaks it. I'm, I'm thinking again, I, you all have gathered, I've been reading a lot of E. Michael Jones, he, he was talking about this problem of evolution of language and saying, you know, can't have evolved because you need two speakers at the beginning, right? So the, there's, who would you speak to? Who would Adam speak, Adam is a hint, who would Adam speak to? Um, but Tolkien is playing off of this, our native language comes seldom to expression save perhaps by pulling at the ready-made till it sits a little easier. But though it may be buried, it is never wholly extinguished and contact with other languages may stir it deeply. So we have, he's, he's done this giant argument about with both in Letter to Auden and that he's been working up with in his, his, his lecture here on English and Welsh to say, and, and in, in this lecture on English to Welsh, he makes the very important claim, which I think I've already shared with you previously, that, um, as he, yes, I did. Uh, language is the prime differentiator of peoples, not of races. Whatever that much misused word may mean in the long blended history of Western Europe. And he's quoting um, from a uh, Finnish scholar. Languages are the chief distinguishing marks of people sorry, Icelander, um, no people in fact comes into being until it speaks a language of its own. Let the languages perish and the peoples perish too or become different peoples. But that never happens except as the result of oppression and distress. And that's a Icelandic um, scholar, Sierra Thomas Simonson. Um, this, I mean, to a certain extent, that is the problem that my colleagues in, in the English department are worrying about with black studies. They're saying we need as scholars of literature to attend to the experiences of, they don't say black Americans because they're trying to be world literature, which is appropriate if you're thinking in terms of English as a world language, thanks to the British empire, which makes it an imperial language, makes, which means Ayan Hirsi Ali is right. Um, that if, you don't attend to the literatures of a people, that people ceases to exist, but then it has nothing to do with their skin color, <laughs> which is what Ayan Hirsi Ali was trying to say, is if you actually cared about it, well, if you, how tightly tied to the existence of a people is the study of that language you know, are black Americans who don't speak Swahili or the other languages that she mentioned, Fulani, Ashanti, Hausa, Swahili, Somali, or Amharic. If you, as a person of a particular skin color, don't speak those languages, does that mean you have, what does that mean <laughs> if you only speak English or you only speak Ebonics and receive pronunciation of some sort, American English or British English? It's like Tolkien was in his scholarship very caught up in this kind of debate that we're having this debate now about what what languages we should study is you know takeaway lesson for today to um it's it's a long question it's a it's a deep question it's been going on for for a good several hundred years um it's deeply tied up with the origins of the ideas of nation but what's interesting but both Tolkien and in, in his scholarship would emphasize over and over and over again is that your your sense of your your sense of a people is tied up with the language but and this this is it confuses me because I'm not quite sure what he's he's doing there your native language isn't necessarily tied either to the language that you learn first your mother tongue the language that you learned from your mother um, nor is it necessarily the same as the people that your family, you know, your family or, or writ large, your kin group, right? Because um, our our native language, the, our mother language, our, our 
I, I don't I need to be precise in my terms because he's he's making all of these different uh, claims um, that your native language comes seldom to expression save by perhaps by pulling it the ready-made till this is a little easier it's like that we each individually craft our own language that that seems a bit chaotic how would we talk to each other um, and that your native language can come out if in fact you study lots of languages, right? He says it may be buried, but it's never wholly extinguished and contact with other languages may stir it deeply. That he's trying to explain, I think, that the reason he liked all of those other languages, that he liked Finnish and he liked Gothic and he liked Spanish, is that in his understanding, somehow they all like tap his sense of his native language. The, 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 not the mother tongue, not the one that he spoke because his mother taught it to him, or the one that he grew up speaking, but this deeper thing that he, the, the tension between the people and the individual is, is very powerful for him and I don't know that he ever resolved it. But anyway, he says, I'll carry on a little bit more. My chief point here is to emphasize the difference between the first learned language, the language of custom, and an individual's native language, his inherent linguistic predilections not to deny that he will share many of these with others of his community. He will share them, no doubt, in proportion as he shares other elements in his makeup. Okay, so maybe you'll like English, but not quite in the same way other people will, but not because you're, you know, you're not born speaking any language. You learn the language that you hear the people around you speaking as you're growing up. But there's deeper down somewhere in your and it's psychophysical right it's not just he is saying blood he is saying there's something physical about the language that is your native language but he's not saying i don't know what he's saying <laughs> in the sense of it's it's bigger it's it's more personal than the people you're related to but it's part of the people that you're related to so for example most english speaking people for instance will admit that cellar door this is his famous most famous example is beautiful especially if dissociated from its sense and from its spelling. More beautiful than, say, sky. I don't know, I like sky. I think, and that's where maybe my, sky is my cellar door. I think sky is a sort of like fresh and, and bubbly word. Cellar door is more sonorous, right? Quite literally. Um, and far more beautiful than beautiful. I do agree there. Beautiful is an odd word. It's like, is beautiful a beautiful word? It's kind of a peppy, beautiful. You're playing with the phonemes, and he's trying to say most English-speaking people, even without knowing the meaning of cellar door, and even more so if you don't see it written down, will hear it as a beautiful conjunction of phonemes. And he says, well then in Welsh, for me, cellar doors are extraordinarily frequent, and moving to the higher dimensions, the words in which there is pleasure in the contemplation of the association of form and sense are abundant. The nature of this pleasure is difficult, perhaps impossible to analyze. It cannot, of course, be discovered by structural analysis. You're going back to saying it's not because of the grammar and it's not because you're doing the sort of um, technical reading of the language. No analysis will make one either like or dislike a language, even if it makes more precise some of the features of style that are pleasing or distasteful. That, that's interesting. So you can't teach aesthetic, the aesthetic response. I don't know whether I agree with him there, but or maybe I do. It's like sky. I disagree with him on sky. I agree with him on cellador and on beautiful. Tricky. The pleasure is possibly felt most strongly in the study of a foreign or second learned language, but if so, that may be attributed to two things. The learner meets in the other language desirable features that his own for own or first learned speech has denied to him, and in any case, he escapes from the dulling of usage, especially inattentive usage. I, I plan to go on here, but as usual, I think I've, I've bitten off more than I can chew <laughs> in my thinking. I think I think that's enough to wrestle with right now. He talks a little bit about his his experience in learning Latin and Greek and, and so forth. Okay, so we have now um, his learning a variety of languages, his sense that some of them have this flavor that he, he's, he's greatly taken with his sense that somehow you are born with a language that may or may not be expressible, that it's brought out by contact with other languages, um, 
and that um, somehow linguistic taste, this the most embodied thing, right, your taste, is a good test of ancestry. Now, remember what remember what um, Bilbo had asked Lindar to do, which was tell the difference between the Hobbit and the the man. And Lindar was saying, "Oh, you know, I can't tell, right? I'm a, I'm an elf, and you mortals have your languages that presumably, in in Tolkien's understanding, it's like they have a particular kind of flavor. They have a particular kind of um, it's not the sense, right? Because Linda isn't saying I didn't understand the poem. It's about Arendelle. We'll talk more about that, uh, obviously, in the future. Um, it's whether or not the the flavor of the language for him could be dis differentiated between the the, the 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 Hobbit and the man. Um, but Frodo, being a Hobbit, somehow nevertheless has access aesthetically to the Elvish that he's hearing the others singing, right? And then he only sort of wakes up when he, he starts hearing Bilbo singing, so he hears the Hobbit singing, um, that we can have access to languages that are not ours and be stirred by them and yet also be cut off from full appreciation of them as Lindar is of the, of Bilbo's, um, the Bilbo's distinction between the human and the, and the Hobbit. As usual, and I know you all, are, we're almost done with the Notion Club papers in this, this sort of setup problem. We've dealt with the dreams and exactly what you can learn with the dreams. We've dealt with the time travel and exactly how seriously Tolkien meant it. Now we see Tolkien wrestling yet again with one of these paradoxes for himself, saying kind of both both things at the same time and denying both things at the same time and the the problem that he's we're we're wrestling with specifically is this this born with question right and he has them he has them talk about it a little bit and the uh Excuse me. Oh, right. He has him. He has him talking. Talking about um, when Raymer is talking about his his travels, right, and saying that he wanted to. One of the things he was hoping for was conversation with other canal rational beings, right. Um, but saying language, Raymer says language properly so called as we know it on Earth, token perceived by sense plus significance for the mind, that is peculiar to an embodied mind an essential characteristic, the prime characteristic of the fusion of incarnation. Only now, to use Jeremy's Louisian word again, would have language. The irrational couldn't and the unembodied couldn't or wouldn't, right? So language is something that T Tolkien is always playing with this problem of the, the incarnate, the embodied, and they're expressing what he's, again, he's often in, in things like his letters or his, his lectures, alluding to debates that he's been having with himself more deeply that very frequently only come out robustly in, in, in things like the Notion Club papers. Um, but he's, he's pl constantly playing off of this tension, as we've been talking about, between what you're born with linguistically and your spirit, right? The, your, your expressiveness, your flavoring, your, your ability to, to reason. Uh, but considering this, this token that's perceived by your senses and the significance perceived by your mind is peculiar to the embodied mind. It's like, again, I'll keep referencing some of my other lectures to, to show you these things all tie together. Um, my first lecture, my first interview with E. Michael Jones, maybe we came up with in the second one too, we're talking about logos and saying, what is it that we're trying to understand with logos and it's mind meeting matter. It's the incarnation, right? We're trying to understand the way in which this this structuring of understanding took on flesh. Well, that mystery, that logos mystery, is absolutely at the heart of everything that Tolkien's doing. Right? He's 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 a he's a philologist. He wants this scientific and historical study of language, but he is committed to this understanding that language is not something that you can have simply as a code. 
right? And he, he's going to get to talking about that more specifically with in the section that I was planning on dealing with. Um, you can't have language just as a pattern of sounds that you can crack, right? And as I said, um, Tolkien, when he's studying these languages, the pleasure that he describes is not of code cracking, right? Now, I, in my own language study, and this is what I could say as, as, as contrast, right? In my own language study, I have a sense of pleasure in cracking the code, right? I can, I can get the dictionary, I can know the grammar, and I can unlock the mystery of what these words are, and there it is, right? It's like I've, I've taken this Latin passage and I've translated it, and once I've cracked it and translated it, I have that sense re reference that I can carry off. And Tolkien would be A, unimpressed, <laughs> um, and and B would say, well, I've 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 like squeezed out the, the uh, you know some kind of dry understanding and left everything that was actually interesting about the language that I was translating from. Go back to say his wine metaphor, right? If like I, well, no, I mean if you squeeze grapes, you get wine, and they both taste nice, but that you have more like, I guess, you know, getting the, the wheat and you've taken the husk off and kept the, no, any, any kind of flavor thing that you keep is going to still fit with Tolkien's embodiedness. The, 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 the difference between he would say you need everything about that carrier of the flavor for the full experience, right? Okay, so we've had Raymer and in the Notion Club papers with his dreams and his dream travel, and the characters have been talking uh, to a certain extent about things that he's learned by way of those dreams in the language. Well, now we have a new character to, to meet who we, we had a, a little hint of in the passage that I was focusing on in the last episode about Norman Keeps, right? And you remember after um, Frankly had been talking about the barber Norman Keeps and his, his vision of history, Loudham, whom we've not really been paying attention to yet, says this kind of odd thing. I know, I know, said Loudham, loudly and angrily. It's a shame. Norman Keeps is a very decent chap and would rather learn truth than lies. But Zigger, pay special attention to the type, curse him. Wait, Zigger? And that is Sauron. So you could say, oh, now that we know it's Sauron, it doesn't move. But Zigger? Why, why doesn't he say Sauron? Why don't we have, if, if this is about tying in Tolkien's real life, present day experience of, you know, wrestling with stories and having conversations with his friends, why have this totally different name, right? Why, why not just say Sauron? Why aren't we tying in the character's experience from the Notion Club papers with what Tolkien said he was trying to do, um, the, the Numenorean story, right? Why do we even have this other language? Well, now we know that there is another language, and who's that? And Loudham is brought on stage in our next night, although it's it's actually sometime later. It's, it's night 66, and it's Thursday, May 22nd, 1987. Um, Loudham is brought on stage to explain the theory of language that Tolkien's working with. We've had Raymer do his theories of dreams and we've had now some discussion on the theory of history and time and having access to a, a greater truth in the mytho mythical time potentially. And now Loudham wake, you know, sort of bursts in and, and starts talking in terms of actual names. And and they say, okay, so what you up to, Loudham? And he, at first he explains a little bit of his own personal history and his full name, that he's Alwyn Arundel Loudham, and that his father named him that, and his father had wanted to name him, not Alwyn Arundel, A-R-U-N-D-E-L, but Alfwina Arundel, E-A-R-E-N-D-E-L, that he, and his, his mother saved him, he says, from being um, Alfwina Arundel, but that would be a more appropriate name for him Alfwina being the Old English for elf friend, 
And Arundel, well, Arundel was a mariner who tarried in Avernium. I, that's, if you remember what, I, I left out the poem <laughs> when I read what Frodo is listening to Bilbo sing, and it's it's the poem about um, um, Elrond's father, right? Arundel was a mariner that tarried in Avernian. He built a boat of Timberfeld and Nimberthel to journey in. Her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made, her prow he fashioned like a swan, and light upon her banners laid. Um, Arundel sails to Valinor and um, never returns. A bracket that thought. You're probably already pretty confused with all my parentheses and closures and, and hold that thought. Yeah, that's what reading Tolkien's like. You know, it's like, okay, so we have Loudum in the Notion Co. Papers, whose name is Arund, whose name should be Arundel, or these Ari Elwin Arundel. His father vanished in 1947, according to the story, on his ship, the Arundel. So you see that we're, we're, we're folding in by way of the names with the experience that Tolkien has given Frodo of hearing this poem that Bilbo wrote and Tolkien's hearing, excuse me, Frodo's hearing of that poem as something that he suddenly understands is clearly also referring to this mystery that Loudham is going to explain to his friends about why he knows who Zigger is, right? Um, now, his father has a ship called the Arundel and vanishes into the Atlantic. Um, Loudham says he just disappeared. <laughs> Strange story, no storm. His ship just vanished into the Atlantic. That was in 1947, just 40 years ago next month. No signals, he wouldn't use wireless anyway. No trace, no news. She was called the Arundel, an odd business. His father go, his father vanishes and um, he grows up with this curious name, this Alfwina Arundel, um, learns that Arundel, his name means great mariner or literally friend of the sea. Um, and from the time of his father's departure, having left him with this elf friend, great mariner name, he starts having, um, he says, curious experiences, um, visitations of linguistic ghosts, you might say. Yes, just that. I'm not a seer. I have, of course, pictorial dreams like other folks, but only what Raymer would call marginal stuff, and few and fleeting at that, which at any rate means that if I see things, I don't remember them. But ever since I was about 10, I've had words even occasional phrases ringing in my ears, both in dream and waking abstraction. They come into my mind unbidden, or I wake to hear myself repeating them. Sometimes they seem to be quite isolated, just words or names. Sometimes something seems to break my dream, as my mother used to say. The names seem to be connected strangely with things seen in waking life. Suddenly, in some fleeting posture or passing light, which transports me to some quite different region of thought or imagination. Um, like the dream, it refers to the dream that Raymer had described for them. Which I think I didn't tell before you that Raymer sees himself sort of hovering over Oxford, the camera, and uh, Loudham is saying, you know, the, the, these, the, the, the language just comes to me. It's not really dreamlike. Some, I'll wake up being able to know it. Um, and, and that he's trying to say it's ghosts somehow is interesting. Um, so, for example, looking at a picture once of a cone shaped mountain rising out of wood, lit, wooded uplands. I've heard myself crying out, desolate is Minotaric, the pillar of heaven is forsaken, and I knew that it was a dreadful thing. But most ominous of all are the eagles of the lords of the west. They shake me badly when I see them. I could, I could, I feel I could tell some great tale of Numenor. Now, it, he's going to then realize, again, Tolkien is using this story to help theorize his own experience. And when he was telling Auden um, and his audience for English and Welsh about the sense of there being such a thing as a native language that um, comes seldom to expression, save perhaps by pulling at the ready-made language that you you know you sort of get by learning your mother tongue until it sits a bit easier. But though it may be buried, it's never wholly extinguished in contact with other languages. May stir it deeply, that he's clearly given Elwyn Arundel Loudham um, his experience of inventing his, you know, 
elvish languages, but you realize Zigger is not elvish. <laughs> um, and he's trying to explain in, in the sense of all of this, what it's like to feel like these are bodied language, right? That I know that they mean something. I know there's a reality out there that goes with these sound combinations that I'm getting and that seem to be significant names, min Minotaric, right? Um, that they're, they're more than just, you know, pleasurable sounds, but they are also pleasurable sounds. And Laudi, uh, sorry, Ari talks about that, um, explaining that he's not getting just one language. And then it's like saying, oh, wait, these are both Tolkien's languages. And so which one is, which one is true Tolkien? Um, but that they, they, they feel different to him and that they both, well, okay. So he says, um, he started getting ghosts coming oftener and clearer. I saw that they were not all of one kind. They had different phonetic styles. See, styles is unlike, well, Latin and Hebrew, which is your clue, right? That one of the languages that he's getting is more Latinate, more liturgical. Um, and he'll come up with saying more to my taste, right? More, more to my, um, more agreeable, right? Uh, and he can work it out and, and likes it. But the other language is um, not like his style, and yet, um, it is is in fact the human language, right? So he 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 he's, he's um, arranged. He does you know this experiment? He it, like it, it fits a little bit with the J M Dunn J W Dunn you know experiment in time kind of thing. But Loudham is getting these these different words. And he's recognizing by their phonetic style that they belong to two different languages, and it's that flavor, Latinate, Hebrew-like, Hebraic, um, that clues him into the differences, right? He can, he can sift them out, so he can say, I arranged in two lists A and B according to their style, with the third bag, rag, rag bag list C for odd things that didn't seem to fit. Um, and they ask, you know, his friends ask, well, do you have a grammar? And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, not yet, that's, but, excuse me. What's interesting is he, he's, he's quite clear, Lanham says, that he's not making these up. And this is where that, that code breaking thing comes in, right? He says, um, I'm not making them up. He's insisting I'm not making them up because they fit phonetically to themselves. And he's, you know, the claim that Tolkien is going to eventually make is that they fit with the, the um, I want to say race because that's going to get us into the black studies question, which is not the, not what Tolkien is dealing with here. He's the species right level. Although we've seen Tolkien talk about all these different human languages and saying they all have different flavors and he likes certain ones of them and that they're somehow part of you because of your blood. But that's not really what, it's certainly not what, he's not giving priority to any language. In fact, Tolkien, right? It's like, and, and if you if you would ask Tolkien at what points, like, what's your favorite language? I'm not sure he would have been able to say. He, he did like different ones with different flavors. It's like saying, you know, do you only like um, peas or apples? Do you only like wine or chocolate? And it's like, you can like all of them differently. And I, I think that's fair to say that that's more like what Tolkien would say. Um, but in Loudham saying he has these, these different languages these two different languages, the Latin and the Hebrew, that he is tasting, um, he's not making them up. He says, um, because he doesn't even really like as much the, the, the language B, the, Heb the Hebraic-like language. Um, he says, anyone who's ever spent or wasted any time on composing a language will understand me. Others perhaps won't, others perhaps won't. But in making up a language, you are free, too free. It is difficult to fit meaning to any given sound pattern and even more difficult to fit a sound pattern to any given meaning. I say fit. I don't mean that you can't assign forms or meaning arbitrarily as you will. Say you want a word for sky, well, call it jibber jabber or anything else that comes into your head without the exercise of linguistic taste or art. But that's code making, not language building. It's quite another matter to find a relationship sound plus sense that satisfies, that is, made, when made durable. When you're just inventing, the pleasure or fun is in the moment of invention. 
but as you are the master, your whim is law, and you may want to have all the fun all over again fresh. You're liable to be forever niggling, altering, refining, wavering according to your linguistic mood and to your changes of taste. It's not the least like that with my ghost words. They came through made, sound and sense already conjoined. So in, in Tolkien's thing, it's like that's the, they're incarnate already, right? The, the, the meaning and the, 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 the hear, what you hear, the phonemes and the sense, um, which sense has two different senses, right? The sense that you can sense physically, it's, you know, taste, hear, see, hear, and sense meaning. But anyway, here he means it, what he can hear and what he can understand come conjoined. So there's logos already, right? I can no more niggle with them than I can alter the sounds or the sense of the word polis in Greek. Many of my ghost words have been repeated over and over again down the years. Nothing changes but occasionally my spelling. They don't change. They endure. Unaltered, unalterable by me. In other words, they have the effect and taste of real languages. But one can have one's preferences among real languages, and as I say I like a best. Now he goes on to explain that these two languages that he is getting and, and not inventing, they're coming through to him, right? They're real languages, he's insisting. And so this is this is another very significant tie for Tolkien to this realism that he is trying to give to his own subcreation, right? We've we've seen how he does it by tying it into history. And I'll probably have more to say about that too. We've seen how he does it tying into this dream practice that Raymer has been doing with the meteorite. Now he's trying to do it with Loudum saying these languages are real. They don't, they're not tricks. They're not, you know, clever little codes that I've, I've made up to, you know, attach jibber jabber to sky. And therefore that, that it's, it's not that, that they, they're real and they are linguistically, phonetically consistent with each other themselves. Right. And so the, the one has the Latin flavor and the other has this this Hebrew favor and what he's realized is you know his own name is with the Latinate right Arendel belongs to the Latinate and he's now going to tell you what he's called each of these languages that the, the Latinate language he calls Avalonian all right um, and the the uh, the other one he's calling Adunaic, right? Um, so Minotarek, pillar of heaven, is a word that's in um, Adunaic. There seems to be some connection between the A word Valar, clue, <laughs> which seems to mean something like the powers. We might say gods, perhaps, and the, and the B plural, his B language is the Adunaic Avaloim, and the place name Avaloni, etc. Et right? So they're, they ha the the two languages have names for the same thing, and you can tell the difference between those names. And the A language, the Avalonian, talks about the Valar, um, and the the B talks about Avaloim. Um, he says, um, for example, Arundel belongs to the Avalonian and contains Era, the open sea, and the stem Indel, love, devotion. That may look a bit odd, but lots of the Avalonian stems begin with N. -d -m 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 which lose their D, B, G, or G when they stand alone. The corresponding Adunayic name, apparently meaning just the same, is Azrubel. A large number of names seem to have double forms like this, almost as if one sp people spoke two languages. If that is so, I suppose the situation could be paralleled by the use of, say, Chinese in Japan, or indeed of Latin in Europe, as if a man could be called Godwin and also Theophilus or Amadeus. But even so, two different peoples must come into the story somewhere. Um, he then explains that, well, the Adonaic is faintly Semitic in its flavor, um, belongs, and he says, belongs more nearly to our world. It's Adamic, right? When he's saying it's Heb Hebrewic or Semitic, he's saying it's human. As opposed to the Avalonian, which he says seems more august more ancient and well sacred and liturgical. Um, I used to call it Elven Latin. The echoes of it carry one far away, very far away, away from Middle Earth altogether, I expect. But I, he paused as if he was listening. 
but I could not explain just what I meant by that. I think that's that's where I wanted to get us. Yes, okay. So he gets we get to the, the this idea, you know, layers of the ideas now. I said I was gonna talk about let's say was, I do have notes. You might think I'm just rambling. I, I do have some notes. Um, that we need to talk about native language and flavor and the way in which languages define peoples and how complicated that is. And 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 you realize that Tolkien wanted Linder, it's like Bilbo wanted Linder to be able to tell the difference between a human, la a human Aragorn's language and Bilbo's language by, and, and what Linder says is I can't tell, it did, he doesn't say I can't tell the difference between, um, well actually what Linder says is I can't tell the difference between you mortals, right? So you could say, well, just you're both mortal and, and as far as Linder is concerned, that's, that's it, right? And Bilbo say, no, well, you know, Aragorn's a man and I'm a hobbit, why can't you tell the difference? That there should be some different flavor, there should be some different, um, is it, what does he mean by blood, right? And I do think in one sense, Tolkien's trying to dance around a lot of things, possibly. We probably want to talk about that a bit more. But the that there's the people defined by the aesthetics of their language and and yet the individuals defined by their native language and yet Tolkien by way of his character Loudham is clearly inventing or we was is he inventing says he's coming th get coming having languages come through one of which he says he prefers the elf latin and the other one he doesn't like so much but recognizing that the one he doesn't like so much is in fact the one that is human. So Tolkien is not saying that he's an elf, just an elf friend, which is what um, they go on to talk a little bit more about. Uh, saying where, where does the word elf come from? I don't know, Loudham answered. It seems the nearest English word for the purpose, but I certainly didn't mean elf in any debased post-Shakespearean sense, sort of sense. That's why Tolkien is always saying he doesn't like Shakespeare, right? Because he doesn't like what he did to the elves. Um, something far more potent and majestic. I'm not quite clear what. In fact, it's one of the things that I most want to discover. What is the real reference of the elf in my name? You remember that I said Anglo-Saxon used to come through mixed up with this other queer stuff as if it had some special connection with it. Well, I got hold of Anglo-Saxon through the ordinary books later on. I began to learn it properly before I was 15 and that confused the issue. Yet it is an odd fact that though I found most of these words already there waiting for me in the printed vocabularies and dictionaries, there were some, and there are still some come through now and again, that are not there at all. Tiwas, for instance, apparently used as an equivalent of the Avalonian Valar, and Nowindaland for Numenor, and other compound names too like Freyafuros, Regenard, and Midswiffen. Midswiffen. Somewhere in very archaic form, like Hebensu, Pillar of Heaven, or Frimaldi, are very antique indeed, like Wiha, Winia. This is dreadful, sighed Frankly, <laughs> where Frankly is our C.S. Lewis character, though I suppose I should be grateful at least that Valhalla and Valkyries have not made their appearance yet. <laughs> but you better be careful, Airy. We're all friends here and we won't give you away, but you will be getting into trouble. If you let your archaic cats out of your private bag among your quarrelsome philological rivals, unless of course you back up their theories. Well, you needn't worry, says Zelaya. I have no intention of publishing this. <laughs> but you realize that that is what Tolkien wanted to do. And it's, it's brought us nicely around to, to where we started that he said he was a Mid West Midlander by birth and re started recognizing language when he started reading the the, the the literature, but had that feeling that he somehow, by birth, by blood, by exactly what, right? Rootedness in the soil, but he wasn't even born in the West Midlands. He was born in Bloemfontein. <laughs> he, I mean, he's like, by the soil he was born on, I guess it's not magic dirt, but something, there's some, this is like, this is the problem. It's like, he doesn't get the language of Bloemfontein as his native language. He gets it w with what he thinks he's related to because of his family lineage, but it's not where he was born. And native language is not necessarily the thing that you grew up to be. He wants so badly 
to have access to this other, this secondary reality, this fairy, which, you know, he's frustrated with Shakespeare always because of the elf problem. And what Laudem and Frankly are in fact doing here, Laudem is saying, I started studying Anglo-Saxon, Old English, right? And there were words I knew that I knew were Old English, but that I've never seen written down. And frankly, as you know, C.S. Lewis character is saying, don't bring this into your scholarship. Now you're going to be telling us you know all the stories of the Valkyries <laughs> and Valhalla, which is probably a reference to, in fact, where a lot of these stories are coming from the Wagnerian element, which we'll get to. Um, but again, it's like this, this always Tolkien gives you some, gives us something and then takes it away. Gives us this idea that these things are, are truly accessible to him, obviously as the author and yet not to be taken seriously. Um, but, and this, this is the, the, the last sort of thought that I'll leave you with that Laudem gives us. He says, I've, I've no intention of publishing any stuff and I haven't come across anything very controversial anyway. I've not made up something that doesn't seem to fit at all with what we know of Anglo-Saxon. After all, Anglo-Saxon is pretty near home in place and time and it's been closely worked. There's not much margin for wide errors, not even in pronunciation. What I hear is more or less what the received doctrine would lead me to expect, except in one point, it is so slow. Compared with us urban chirrupers, the farmers and mariners of the past simply mouthed, savored words like meat and wine and honey on their tongues, especially when declaiming. They made a scrap of verse majestically sonorous, like thunder moving on a slow wind or the tramp of mourners at the funeral of a king. We just gabble the stuff. But even that is no news to philologists and theories, though the realization of it in sound is something more theory hardly prepares you for. And of course, the philologists would be very interested in my echoes of very archaic English, even early Germanic, if they could be got to believe they were genuine. So now we have, I hope, some better understanding of what was going on when Frodo, dreaming, heard those melodies, found himself immersed in the singing of the elves and, 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 and taken away, right? Visions of far lands and bright things that he had not, never yet imagined opened out before him and the firelit hall became like a golden mist above seas of foam that sighed upon the margins of the world. Then the enchantment became more and more dreamlike until he felt that an endless river of swelling gold and silver was flowing over him, too multitudinous for its pattern to be comprehended. It became part of the throbbing air around him and it drenched and drowned him. Swiftly he sank under its shining weight into a deep realm of sleep. That what Tolkien I mean, the thing I think that he wanted most in his in his life was to get that feeling of recitation <laughs> that the bards must have had in the mead halls, and the I I certainly I don't read Old English with anything like Tolkien's ability and hardly any facility myself. But even then, I get and this is the the one place I would say, even then I get what he's describing when you have that sense of we are now in the oldest moment of the story. I, I was talking to a friend uh, the other day about how, in fact, the oldest literature we have in Old English is a story of creation. It's Cadman's Hymn. And I, I, there's in my medieval history series on unauthorized uh, lecture specifically on that, that what Tolkien, if he's at that moment of creation constantly, he wants to have the beginning the beginnings of words not just in the beginning was the word which is the creation story but that tie to the moment at which the speaking takes on flesh the speaking becomes real and and you are caught up in the story simply by hearing the words the sound and the sense come together perfectly and the world comes in to being that we we could that is Tolkien's great dream. 
Thank you for joining me. We will be talking more about poetry next time to be continued.